Hey there, today we're gonna to be talking about hacking. Not that kind. My name is Connor. Today we're gonna to be looking at how we release bald eagles and other birds of prey through a system called hacking. Before we get started, be sure to hit that like button, and if you like our content, hit that subscribe button as well. We also stream live on Twitch twice a week, so if you wanna ask us questions and we can answer you real time, whether that's based on this video or any questions for birds of prey or bald eagles, we'd love to have you. As you guys might already know, we almost lost the bald eagle in the early 60s and 70s, and one of the many methods to help bring the bald eagle back from the brink of extinction was a breeding program. Well, if you have a breeding program, you need a way to release them. And one of the best ways to release a bald eagle is through a hack tower, or what I like to call an eagle treehouse. After an eaglet reaches a certain age, generally around six weeks old, they're moved to the hack tower where they learn to become wild eagles. Here, they learn how to use their wings, perch, tear up whole food, and the list goes on. But the most important thing is that the eaglets don't learn that food comes from people. Or in other words, they don't become a human imprint. They wouldn't be able to survive out in the wild on their own, but how do we keep these eaglets from becoming a human imprint and still feed them? Well, we use a sliding tray door. All we do is slide the tray out, put the food in, and then slide the tray back, and they never know it comes from people. Once they're about 14 weeks of age, that front door is lifted up and they're released into the wild. But I'm sure a lot of you guys knew this already, so today we're gonna take a deeper dive into the hack tower, and we're gonna take a look at the past five years of data and yes, we've been doing this since 1991, but we still have a lot of questions like what's the future of Hack Tower and what can we learn from all of this data? And for that, we're bringing on Caitlin to help us answer some of those questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for joining us. Yeah, of course. So how long have you been involved with the Hack Tower? About nine years. Wow, that's, that's a lot of time. So you've seen a lot of changes, particularly in the past five years. What are some of those major changes? Absolutely. So a few of the major changes are we release them later. So in the wild, they typically fledge between 10 and 14 weeks. And we picked the middle and that worked for a while, but it is a little bit early for some of the eagles. True. So in a way to get them more individualized plans, we've kind of shifted to 14 weeks, just because it's a little bit easier on those eaglets. It's funny you say individualized plans. Um, what are some of the, we're trying to do that a lot more at AEF for every bird from yes. rehab to education birds, building plans to fit them and what's mm -hmm. best for that individual. For Hack Tower, how are we able to do that? With Hack Tower, um, there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. First of all, we're not just releasing bald eagles anymore. We're releasing other types of birds from there. We're able to keep an eye on them more often, um, just taking notes, taking more detailed notes so that we can say, okay, at this point they seem ready to fledge, but we're not sure yet. We'll keep them just a little bit longer. Um, there was some birds last year that we kept till 15 weeks because they just weren't ready yet. Um, and then there's been birds that we've released earlier. So it really allows us a little bit more flexibility within the plans. So some of the other major changes that have happened are the technology up there. Everybody knows that technology is not my thing, but uh, you did a really good job putting those cameras up there so that we have more of a monitoring system. Cameras are awesome. How have the cameras helped build an individual plan for each eaglet release? With the cameras, we're able to see, you know, individual growth within the birds, you know. Um, a lot of times we were kind of guessing it, you know, are they eating this size food or this size food? Uh, and that allowed us to see if they were ripping and tearing or how much they were on the perch versus how much they were under the perch. And we can really see, you know, when they're winger sizing or when they're eating, how fast they're eating, all of those kinds of things. Also, uh, the tracking has come such a long way. The very first time I went out to track an eaglet, we had like this ET phone home radio situation <laughs> where you just listen for the beeping and hope you got close. There are GPS systems out there, and we did put them on two birds in 2012, but they were about $3,000 a piece. So it's just not feasible for a nonprofit. Right. Um, now we've moved to what we call the whistle trackers, which is just like a pet tag tracker okay. um, so that we can see where they're going, make sure that they are in the area or that they've left the area, all of that sort of thing. Um, and they've just upped their uh, battery life 
on the tracker itself. So hopefully we'll be able to get some more data. It says about 20 days now. That's awesome. And you're, you're kind of experimenting with them right now, right? Yeah. So I turned it on on July 1st. Uh, just to see what would happen because I really didn't believe it. Right. Um, and we're only down to 86% and here it is uh, July 8th. Nice. So seven, eight days and yeah. that maybe you can get 20, more than 20 days out of it. Hopefully. So expensive trackers, the GPS ones were three grand. How much are these new whistle trackers? They're about $150, so much more reasonable. Still a little expensive, but. So, so how do you mount those trackers on the birds and do they come off of them? Yes, they do come off of them. Uh, so we use a tail mount just like you would with a falconry bird for telemetry. Um, we modify the whistle trackers and are able to slip them right on the middle tail feather. That way um, it doesn't throw their um, balance off or anything of that nature. And then when they molt that feather, it'll come off as well. Generally in the wild, when a bald eagle fledges, they'll do one of two things. One, they'll leave or, or they'll come back and come get the food from, from the parents. So our birds over the hack tower, they probably leave pretty fat and happy. Uh, when you leave food out, are you seeing them come back in the past five years? In the past five years, I've been collecting data just to see if they do come back. And we have left food out there just to make sure, um, but not a single bird has come back to the hack tower itself. So another um, point I want to talk about with the hack tower is I've, I've heard that some people um, say that they imprint on that specific location but from what I've known is that they imprint on the general geographic location and they'll come back, what, 75 to 225 miles? Correct. So uh, just because we release them from the hack tower in Dandridge, Tennessee, doesn't mean that they know where those county lines are. They're not going to come back to that exact area. So we've released 177 eagles at this point. If they all came back to the hack tower, we would be seeing eagles every time we went out there um, and Lady Independence is a good example of that because we released her and she came back about 20 to 30 minute drive from here. The Hack Tower is built at least 20 years ago over at Douglas Lake and there's been a lot more urbanization and more recreation use right? Absolutely so we see a lot more houses just because we are in a touristy area and people love Douglas Lake and uh, there's a lot more boating, fishing tournaments, and in general recreational use. There's even a campground that just popped up out of nowhere this year. So um, although Douglas Lake is a great place to release eaglets, um, and we've seen a lot of eagles come back to this area, especially over quarantine, we were getting calls that there were six, seven eagles all in one tree, kind of like Alaska. So nice. it was really cool to see. Um, but it also presents that issue of carrying capacity that we might want to start looking at other places um, just to make sure that these eagles have their best chance at life. So we've had a unique opportunity with Seven Islands that they've offered to allow us to release birds there. Um, and it is a state birding park, so they have a lot of vultures, eagles, red shoulders, barn owls, all of those different species. So the French Broad River runs right through the middle of it. There's plenty of trees. So we're really excited about the potential to actually release GG3 there. So at Seven Islands, there's 416 acres of protected habitat for these birds to get used to their environment, for them to spread their wings and really get into that innate learning and use their instincts. So the first couple of days are important just to do those sorts of things and it provides that solitude for them. Um, whereas Douglas Lake is still a great place for them to acclimate, um, but it has just pockets of the seclusion, so they are more likely to interact with humans. Since the bald eagle is no longer endangered and many of our breeding pairs here at AEF are getting older and not producing as many young, um, we're going to shift some of those resources to endangered species here in East Tennessee.